Obviously, a talk on Gen 2. What we like to do sometimes, with this going way back to Eric Andrzejczyk's days, uh, is go around the room and each one of us just say, Hi, my name is, and answer a question of the night, which I famously never think of until I'm already talking to you. So, my question is going to be, how comfortable do you, are you with compiling software? Because I'm assuming we're going to do that a bit. Um, so, hi, my name is Nate. And um, I can compile a program if I have to, but if at all possible, I try to install it some other way. Um, and uh, I have about half success compiling some programs, and some, sometimes I've run into issues that I can't solve on my own. Um, let's go here, and we'll just go around this way. All right, my name's Rodney, and uh, I'm comfortable with compiling it, but uh, I need to do it for me, actually. Okay. Uh, I'm Robert Archer. Uh, scale of 1 to 10, I'd probably give myself a 2 on okay. compiling software. Yeah. All right. Hi, my name is Chris, and last time I, 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 last time I did that a lot was in the 90s, so. Yeah, okay. I could do it, I think, if I had to, but. Okay, let's come down here. Um, my name is Kyle. Um, I, yeah, I can, I can compile from source, but I can't do it for not to. For not to? Okay. I'm Gary. Gary? I might be a point mm -hmm. five. Okay, <laughs> fine, fine. <laughs> I guess I'm too generous. Point point point. <laughs> okay. My name is Ron, and it was assembly language in the 80s, and that was a long time ago. Okay, great. I'm Alex. Uh, I'd say 7 out of 10. I've okay. uh, done my fair share of compiling stuff, but it got lazy. I just prefer the just install method. Great. Eric has compiled for a long time ago. Okay. 
I'm sure. <laughs> okay, sounds good. I'm Lauren, I'm not technical, so I'm going to get She's like, what is compiling? <laughs> <laughs> is that like non-violent? <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My name is Tom, I'm a computer code of works in Sagas, I'm going to hit that zero, although I've been on the latest desktop for three years. Okay. So, uh, I must have something. Yeah, Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and our speaker. Of course, I'm Brian. I'm actually going to talk on Gen 2, so. <laughs> so, I would think you would. Yeah, I, 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 I professionally work as a developer, so. Okay. So, I guess you would compile on the very regular basis. Right, so, Linux stuff. I don't know. Right, yeah. <coughs> And before we get rolling with our, our presentation, um, I just want to give a shout out to Tech Systems, who is providing pizza and soda to all of you for free, just for coming out and being a part of this. So thank you. We want to give them a round of applause. Thank you for what you do. All of you here, of course. And could you say a couple words about what you do and what Tech Systems is about? Yeah, um, so as I mentioned, my name is Lauren. I am a recruiter with Tech Systems. Uh, we are a nationwide company where our local office is in Harrisburg. My job is to network with IT professionals like yourself, understand what you're looking for, uh, maybe your next job opportunity, you're just going to hear about what's going on in the market, and provide you with the best IT positions that we possibly have. So if you have any questions about the market or just are looking for a contact, just grab my card and let me know. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. And with that, we'll turn it over to Brian. Thank you. All right. So let's talk Gen 2. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Gen 2 has this reputation. It's certainly geared towards power users, can be intimidating when you first start to look at it. Um, and it tends to give you more ways to screw things up, either by your actions or being upstream. Can you speak upstream? I can try. Yes. Anyways, uh, you don't mind me? Um, I don't have a way to plug you in. That was the cable that I missed. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> so the audio and the video recording is going to be cracked. Yep. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, yeah. It's, it's potentially yellow, way, a lot more ways to screw things up than your average Linux distro. Um, all in all, it has a reputation in some circles of being more trouble than it's worth. Not entirely unwarranted reputation. Uh, I'm, not, I'm certainly not a salesman for Gen 2 by any means. So. Uh, on the other hand, Gen 2 is very versatile and very powerful. So it's it's a, it's an adventure, but um, well, it's definitely a good system to know how to use if you want to put in the time. So what we're going to be talking about is just what is it that's different about Gen 2 for most Linux systems and um, what really makes it stand out. Um, to be fair, being versatile is not really a Gen 2 specific thing. Most distros are fairly versatile um, and certainly some are geared more towards desktop users versus server users. Some can go either way. So I'm not going to get too much into the like the distro to distro differences at that point. I'm going to highlight what makes Gen 2 special. So the basics of using Gen 2, again, that are not just your average Linux stuff, so like bash scripting or bash command line. That's all the same. Your graphical environments are pretty much going to be the same once you get it up and running. Um, scripting languages are all there. But uh, just the things you need to know that are different than most other distros. And we're going to walk through an installation. And uh, again, it's high level. Uh, there's plenty of documentation out there uh, that will take you through it in way more detail than I have the time to do. It would be worth any, any So you're not going to do a full installation in 45 minutes? No. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't have the horsepower in this machine for that, for sure. <laughs> you know, I, suppose, I suppose even if my Gen 2 does a lot, if I pre-built everything and installed uh, binary packages, I'd probably get away with it, but that's still yeah, a little tedious. So that's what we're talking about. So how is Gen 2 different? 
at a high level, I think there's like two ways that it separates itself. Uh, the first is uh, there are certainly a lot more examples of this, but Gen 2 is rolling voice versus most of the popular distros, uh, in Debian's or Red Hat's, Ubuntu Mint, Fedora, they're all fixed release or you know, version, like any other piece of software, they got a version number, usually a code name, whatever. Um, and all the feature updates, all for all of the applications contained in the distro, all come at once. And anytime there's like a new version of any piece of software, it has to wait for everything else to be ready to move forward. Rolling release updates just come whenever they're ready. Um, and it's not just limited to bug fixes like the epic fix for this distro. Uh, there's certainly a lot of other examples of rolling release distros. Arch, um, I can't think of all the list off the top of my head. Um, yeah, there's the testing branch of Debian is pretty well in release uh, until it freezes for stabilizing the next stable. Um, a lot of other distros like testing branches and other distros. But you also get situations like BSD based scenarios where there's a fixed release of basically the core of the OS and then everything else, other applications on top of that, that are going to be more release. And I've heard of instances where it's actually the opposite, although I don't know what exactly the appeal of that is, where the core would be more release than the current one, uh, the core system libraries, and then on top of that is fixed release. But anyway, Gentoo is rolled over. So that's one. The other way Gen 2 is different, and uh, Nate, you alluded to this earlier, Gen 2 is source-based. Most, and this one is a little more unique to Gen 2, because most of the other distros I mentioned that are also role release, they compile the code for you and distribute binaries. Gen 2 does not distribute binaries, they just distribute source code. <coughs> With a few exceptions, like some of the bigger packages, long time to compile all their hardware. I think Firefox, uh, Chrome, some things where they don't have source, like Steam. Uh, but those are the exception rather than the rule. Yeah, the Gen 2 So, either the fact that there's pros and cons either way. Um, rolling release, you get up, like I said, you get feature updates much more quickly. Don't have to wait around for everything to move. Um, in theory, bug fixes can be more timely, but you know, best practice is to release fixes for various older versions in sync with the latest version anyway. Uh, so people don't decompile a patch and uh, start attacking the older systems that haven't been patched yet. Um, on the other hand, rolling release can be a little vulnerable for like an enterprise set. Yeah, enterprises like to sit on things until they absolutely have to move them unless there's a critical security patch. Uh, downtime costs money. Um, you know, incrementing versions of software potentially causes downtime. So they sit on things. And also the popular theory, anytime you're introducing new features, newer versions of the main piece of software you bring along with bugs with it. Pretty much unavoidable. Um, but as a developer, I <laughs> Developing is the process of putting bugs in the code. <laughs> so, as far as being source based versus pretty much every other major distro I've ever heard of that isn't a derivative of Gen 2, or Linux from scratch, of course, but every other, gen, every other distribution that's binary, they compile the code for you. And when they do that, they have to compile for like the lowest common denominator. Um, within a family of major architectures like AMD 64, um, you know, there's a lot of different iterations of CPUs. There's the early Athlons, all the way up to the Ryzen 7, and uh, what's Intel on now? Coffee Lake? Or Cat Lake? One of those two, it doesn't matter. Um, but the newer ones have a lot of newer instruction sets that don't exist on the older chips. You compile your code to use those optimized instruction sets on the newer chips, the dry line on the old chips, you don't have a problem. And it's not exactly practical for the distros to build all those various you know, iterations of processor optimizations of the code. So, as I said, those come from. 
So if you're compiling it yourself, you know what your hardware is. You can enable the optimizations. If you get it wrong, you're the only one who breaks, uh, not the rest of the world. And it's not the distro's fault, it's your fault. But of course, that takes a lot more computational overhead. It takes time. It's a lot longer to install a Gentoo system than it is to install Mint or Ubuntu or Red Hat. Now the other trade-off with binary distributions, they're picking what they're picking how things are built, what features are enabled with a particular package, and what like if there's multiple dependencies that a package can use, they decide which one you get. And Sometimes they can build it so that it will jump between the dependencies easily enough, but you are still somewhat at the mercy of this one really, to decide how the package is built, what features you have available to you, whether you want them or not. Sometimes they might include features you don't want. Um, proper security best practices would be to minimize your attack service and the service. Don't install anything you don't need if you get that feature they enabled is something you don't need or want, it's potentially harder to keep it out of the binary distribution. When you're source based, you're given a lot more control and, um, of how things are built, how things are installed, how things are set up. So that can be a security advantage. So, compiling from source, um, in the traditional way, obviously, download the tarball, extract it, configure, make, make, install. That's not what I'm talking about with Gentoo. Gentoo does have package management, which is probably a relief to anyone that was thinking about actually trying this, because package management does make things a lot easier than having to find all dependencies, make, configure, make, make, install each and every one of them, as opposed to just having the package management do it all for you. Now, the package manager in Gen 2 is called Portage. It's based <coughs> off of the FreeBSD Portage tree, or at least inspired by it. Um, let's show you some screenshots of that better than you might be able to see it if you're familiar with FreeBSD. It supports dependency resolution. If you want to install something that requires this library, you don't have to install the package manager. Will figure that out and install it in Portage. It supports uh, a feature flag mechanism called Use Flags where you can, rather, I was hinting at earlier, we enable or disable various features of applications that you might or might not want. That's the mechanism we use to do it. Uh, Portage supports side-by-side um, -side installation of different versions of the same package, depending on the package. Um, we call that slots. Like, for instance, if you want Python 2 or Python 3, uh, they're based on the same package with different versions and it's installed into different slots. And they don't conflict with each other. Uh, there is masking, which allows you to control what will or won't get installed in your system. Now there's two types of masking in Gen 2. There is what's called a hard mask, where the package or the version of the package will just never get installed unless you reconfigure to unmask it. Um, and there's also keyword masking, which is basically their way of specifying that this package is installable on this architecture family, and it's stable. This version is stable. There are packages that are that have many different versions, some of which are stable, some of which are in a testing state. Some of them are stable on one architecture, like AMD64, and tested on ARM. Uh, all of this is overridable, so you can install things that are still tested on ARM or not even supported on ARM when they're available <coughs> in the architecture. Uh, the results can vary. But, uh, another, uh, Another little feature of Portage is called Profile, which is kind of like course adjustment for uh, like use flags and masking. And it's kind of the first step of configuring how you want your system to, to be set up. 
There's profiles for just a bare bones Gen 2 system. There's a desktop profile which will, will enable the X use lag among other things. Um, and other things that other use flags that are suitable for a desktop environment. Uh, there's a known specific desktop profile. Linux profiles, <coughs> if you want your system to be using SE Linux. Um, there's a hardware profile, which is used for <coughs> servers, for um, compiling things with more um, security oriented compiler settings enabled. <coughs> So when you're setting up how you want your system to be built, your first step will be to configure the profile before you get into more of the way you're ready to stuff. Also, Gentoo allows you to patch the applications as you're installing them without having to like, do everything by hand. You would cer certainly have to like patch, but then you just plug, you drop it into a particular folder, and as you're building that package, it will pick up that patch apply it and build it right in and you're still all within the packet manager <coughs> versus you, know, you, you can compile the code on a binary distro just as just as just fine um, but you're, you're doing it all by hand you're taking yourself pretty much out of the package manager and it's up to you to pretty much keep things up to date with, with uh gent with portals patch patching Still like all right in there. I'm going to update. Forward uh, to see it. And then bring patch forward. Uh, another somewhat useful feature of Portage called sets. Uh, it's basically like groupings of pack, uh, groupings of packages that you can operate on, on all of those packages at once without having to specify each and every individual one at a time if you're trying to do something here. Whether you're installing that entire set installing that entire set. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of configuration at the outset. You're doing that, but once it's set up, once it's defined, you're going to type So this is what the uh, portage tree looks like for, at the outer layer. Uh, there's a bunch of categories there. Uh, like I said, similar to the ESP ports tree. Inside the category, you have various individual applications. And then within, I pick one of them. You have um, some metadata files and the ebuild scripts, which are the various versions of that package. And uh, the ebuilds are basically scripts that define the build process. You declare dependencies. You Point it at the source, uh, the URL to download the source from, and then define if if it's anything other than extract the tarball, configure the main install, then you can basically define the things that deviate from that in the e build. But in a lot of, in, I'm sure there's a lot of cases where it's very simple, but for the most part, you don't need to know too much about that. There are utilities. Graphical and command line. Of course, it starts with strictly command line for, do, for interacting with Forge. And it pretty much begins and ends with the command emerge. So, these are some examples of some uh, commands you'll need to use when you're managing packages. Um, installing, just emerge, the name package. Uh, if you want a specific version, proceed it with equals, and then you have to specify the full package name, including the category. It's a little tedious, but it is what it is. Uh, if you don't know uh, the exact name of the package, you use the hyphen s argument to search for it. Of course, I specify the full name of the package in that example anyway, but uh, that will also give you other packages like plugins for Apache, for instance. Uh, we want to tell your 
system to go get the updated formula tree, we use hyperlight and sync arguments. And then we actually want to install the updates that we just read about. Um, good practice is to use U capital N capital D. And world is a set, is a globally defined, system defined set of all the packages that you have to solve on your system. Uh, you can install updates to packages one at a time or just all in one shot. Um, strictly speaking, uh, the U <coughs> is the only thing that will be for updates. The capital N is when you uh, change to use flags, but package, um, the package that, or any packages that are affected by those use flag changes, uh, if they're still the same version, but you change use flags, if you change your profile, if you switch from like a known desktop to a KDE desktop, I forget it as a KDE desktop, that will change some use flags. So maybe a packet will have changed from default use flags to enable your profile without any changes. Uh, capital N will pick up those changes from the use flags and bring them over the new use flags. Capital D, you know, when I looked at this the other day, what exactly capital D does, when you're updating the world, I don't know that it actually would have a whole lot of impact. Because the definition of capital D is to search the entire way down the dependency tree. Uh, when you're updating the world, it's going to pick up pretty much everything anyway. But if you're just updating one package at a time, capital D is probably going to be. Now, if you're done with the package and you want to uninstall it, the option for that is hyphen C. Lowercase will prevent uninstallation if there's anything that depends on it. Capital C will ignore dependencies and just rip the package right out of there, so use that precaution. If you're uninstalling something that pulled along a bunch of dependencies that are now no longer needed, you can you can do this separately or along with the initial uninstall of hyphen C. Hyphen hyphen depth will remove dependencies that are no longer necessary. And in the hopefully unlikely instance that you wind up needing to rebuild the whole system top to bottom, uh, sometimes you'll wind up running into updates where there's weird conflicts. Um, I think I had that happen to me when Perl moved from 5.22 to 5.24. Um, it kept trying to, there was something in my system that kept trying to bring back the old version. So I just solved that by rebuilding the whole system. Um, also, they recently released a new set of profiles late last year, which enables in a new flag by default in GCC. And if you didn't rebuild the whole system, you're likely to run into problems. So it's, and it's not, the you know, rebuilding the whole system isn't just but sometimes, and hopefully this is infrequent, it's not fun to do it, it's not fun to do this. Um, you know, when they release the new profiles, they're like, update this, update this, update this, then rebuild the whole system. That's a little annoying, but you have to do it. But if you do that, the entire system is in its empty tree with hyphen. Now, if you just want to look at what's going to happen before it actually happens, <coughs> it's like the key is the option to do that. And that should pretty much apply to any of the um, commands I have up there, with the except, probable exception of sync and search, because I don't know why you would bring that. And that's going to happen. And if you want to see what's installed, uh, it's a separate command called query. Strangely, this is not part of the default install. You have to install a package called Gen Toolkit. And I don't understand it's installed by default, but it's not. Now that right there will list, will show you that you have a patch installed and what version you have installed. Um, you can leave out the category if you're looking for a specific package. Um, or you can leave out the wildcard. 
wildcard searches. Um, you, can, you can do wildcard searches just by the query list www-server slash star or just star slash star or just star list everything. Now I, on the way over here, I was thinking I probably should have added a slide for another command that's part of Portage called eselect. Uh, that one's, uh, it's got a few functions. Um, the profiles I mentioned earlier, eselect is how you specify, is the primary way of switching profiles. It's also the primary way of switching which version of Python you want to use or Ruby. update your system, or when you resync your portage tree, sometimes you'll get uh, news releases. Uh, E-select will be how you read those. Um, yeah, for instance, when they released the profiles that told you to read the entire system, the uh, E-select news uh, was how they delivered the announcement. Uh, the other thing uh, about system Gen 2 is the init system. They support two of them. They are system D neutral. They support it. Or they make it available and it is supported. It's not the default. But they don't make it difficult to switch to or from it. The default init system is called OpenRC. It's Gen 2's own init system. You can get it on other platforms like Debian. Portable to BSDs and hasn't been really used on most uh, BSD at least. Um, yeah, it basically is. There, there's two parts of system init. There is the init process, the first program, the first process that the kernel starts, the last one that shuts down. It's the ultimate parent to every process that's running on your system. And the other half of SysVNet is basically process or service initialization and run levels, uh, which manages start, uh, starting everything out and shutting everything, shutting everything down. OpenRC basically, by default, replaces that run level side of things, while still using SysVNet as the process, the master process of groups and <coughs> Alternatively, you can use BusyBox, or it also provides its own thing, but still be false assistant. I'm going to talk a little bit about how you interact with OpenRC. System D is going to cover, I'm sure, all of the place. Uh, yeah, it's not a Gen 2 specific thing. So but one of the things that makes OpenRC different than SysVNet is SysVNet has run levels as you move, you start at run level one, which like brings up some basic system things, and then move to run level two, which is where you normally operate. Run level one will bring up uh, the map your file systems, uh, initialize hardware, bring up probably bring up networking, and run level two will spawn um, your cron server, SSH, um, Apache, if you're running a name server, or if you're running a name server, or whatever. And then you live in one level two until you want to reboot or shut down, then you move to six or zero, respectively. OpenRC uses the name for which is a little easier to follow. Just looking at that, that means a hell of a lot more to me than one level two. So when you're actually interacting with OpenRC, there's the old-fashioned way of managing your services. The Etsy NFD name of service starts off restart. That works, you know, that's not what people necessarily tell you to do anymore. They 
Uh, so this is something that we're going to use service, name of service, start, stop, restart. I like autocompletes for the name of services, so I typically wind up just using the FC calling the get scripts directly. And that still works in OpenRC. But the theoretical proper way to do that is with the RC service command, which doesn't really look a whole lot different than the service command in the Syspian And you know, for all intents and purposes, for the most part, you're not going to need to do too much more than what you're seeing there. So a little different, but lots of changes. Controlling which, cross, which services get brought up at the boot or at when you enter any particular run level is accomplished by using the RC update. Um, it's basically RC update. Excuse me. RC update. I can speak. Add name of service to, for the most part, the default level. RC update add SSHD. Anytime you install a service, it's not enabled by default for the most part. Uh, the base installation will bring up a lot of the sysadmin and boot run level services and, and, uh, and mounting and everything like that. But pretty much anything that's going to default, you have to configure. You have to tell it to enable it. So, now that you have that, that knowledge, you've got installation, which I will just say this much, follow the handbook. Um, just Google search Gen2 handbook, or Gen2, probably Gen2 AMD64 handbook, probably the first one that comes up in the AMD64 class. That handbook will walk you through the installation process in way more detail than I could have it. I was going to try, I could just be standing up here reading it verbatim anyway. So that's, that's just a mess. So I'm going to stick to a little bit of a high level. I'm not going to go too many in bit of detail into each of the individual steps. Because the handbook will basically already do that for you. And way more eloquently than I have to tell you than I ever could. Because clearly I'm a, an accomplished professional speaker. So first and foremost, you got to boot into a Linux environment. They offer a live CD, so do many other distros, and you can use any one of them if you already have it burned. You can use a, a system that you already have installed. I have uh, built up Gen2 installs from within a CH root on an existing installation of Linux in, in preparation for switching over to minimize downtime. Uh, of course, if you're doing that, just the CH root is probably not ideal. Um, it should be something that Grub can, can address, like a separate partition. If you've got LVM, a separate uh, LVM volume. Or if using the ZFS or ZFS, a sub volume will suffice. Um, speaking of which, now once you're booted into the next environment, that's your next step is allocate the disk space for the installation. Uh, allocate the disk space, make a file system, and get it done. Then we gotta download and, and extract to this new installation into this new file system a base image, which is going to be commonly referred to as a stage three. Gen2 is built in you know, built up in stages. Um, you can still do source uh, stage one build from home, but they don't really support that anymore and you're pretty much just gonna start with that one stage three anyway. So this is where you have to start thinking a little bit more than you would with your average Linux distro. Because there's a lot of options for stage threes to download. Uh, that first bullet point probably should be invisible. Uh, for the most part, it's AMD64 anymore. Unless you use a Pi or something, and then obviously R. Apple laptop or something that we can already see, or there's an actual monitor or something like that. Uh, 
there's different stage threes for multi, multi loop or no multi loop. Like if you're running a 64 bit build, you might or might not want there to be compatibility for 32 bits. Um, I'm not sure um, a whole lot of compelling reasons to be pure 64 bit. So, personally, my recommendation would be just go with multi loop unless you absolutely don't need it. Because it's a little bit harder. From what I read, it's a little bit harder to switch from no multi way to multi way if you start with multi -way. There are stage threes with SE Linux by default. You can certainly switch to or from SE Linux, but this gives you less to rebuild if you switch to it right off the bat. Uh, there's different stage threes for OpenRC or system theme. Again, you can switch between the two reasonably easily. Uh, I guess I've never actually done a switch, but it's documented. It's, I guess, theoretically supported. Um, but if you're going to use system, if you know you're going to use system, you might as well start with that. Uh, I previously mentioned hardened profiles as opposed to like a standard. Um, hardened profile will. Compile code with more security oriented compiler flags enabled by default. Uh, theoretically, you could also switch from standard to hardened, but ideally, you would be recompiling everything to enable uh, the secure compilation. So, you might as well just set up hardened default. Quick question Do they have just like 25 different download options, like for each architecture, or is there just like uh, like, how, how do you pick between these, or does it build it when you download it? No, it, it, it has, like, these sort of options it has pre built okay. various options for you. I don't know if it's 25 necessarily, like you said, but. Uh, so, so I can pick, like, you know, uh, multi lib SE Linux system D hardened, it will have that tarball for you to download. If you, if you use e select list, it lists all the different profile packages for basic systems of full desktop, you can choose. Hard and no the multi the multi the so like, yes. so like 98 choices. Okay, so this yeah, is HR support. That's, 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 that's actually after you've got the system running. This is just when you're just starting to abstract. So, so this is a tarball that I would pick down. Yes. Okay. Yes. And you know, you, met, you mentioned like however many profile options there are. They don't have a stage three for each and every single one of them. They don't have any desktop stage three necessarily. But they have a few options. Probably the <coughs> ones with the greater impact to switch between after you've got the system. So once you've figured out which stage three you want, downloaded it, and extracted it, when we get back to the installation process, you need to mount some file systems, some system file systems inside of that target. Uh, your slash dev, your slash proc, there's a couple others. Uh, Install the portage tree. Uh, basically, they offer slightly snapshots of the portage tree in the state it was at the time of snapshot. Um, you just download that and extract it. Um, the default location for that, for that to be extracted to will be slash USR slash portage. And of course, that's configurable to be wherever you need it to be. Configure DNS within the installation target. Pretty much just copy nsresolve.com inside of your installation. Um, now, I, I did have this uh, bite me here and there because I run with a UMass that prevents any file I create from being non readable. And that gave me problems once I tried to go inside that system. System. By default anymore, I, I don't think that's usually the case, but if you are running with a more restricted view mask, just, I, it, it's probably just a good idea to double check that that file is well with it. Portage does a lot of its operations as a non root user, and if that file is not well readable, it won't, know, it won't be able to resolve DNS, so it won't be able to download all the source code it's trying to do. The error was just, I don't think the error is particularly friendly. It took me a while to figure out that it took me a while to figure out that we had a problem. Um, 
Now at that, we should start configuring the file options if you do so desire. We can also do everything just as default. Um, the profile would be, now would be a time to pick the profile if you want to deviate from what was defaulted in the stage three you downloaded. Actually, that would probably be after scheduling into your installation target. Yeah, if you try to run the eselect command to switch profiles, you have to be inside of your transfer system. So, yeah, ch root into that, reconfigure the compile options. If you're going to configure your system to compile for your exact mo more modern CPU architecture, now would be the time to rebuild everything with all those The list of packages that will be rebuilt is as small as it's ever going to be. So that'll be shortened how long it will take to rebuild it. And here's where the plugin is installing a kernel. Uh, the main way of doing that is from source. Uh, you install source package, uh, typically Gen2 sources, but one of the other ones, vanilla uh, sources, which is straight from the kernel source tree. Gen2 sources apply to a few Gen2 specific patches. Uh, there used to be hardened sources. Um, a company called GR Security applied some hardening patches to the Linux kernel. Uh, that kind of away, at least officially. Uh, I got forked into projects that are not in the orange tree currently. Um, I remember all of the available kernel options that Raspberry Pi sources. By the large, they would strongly recommend just using Gen2 sources. So you install that package, it doesn't build the code for you because there's way too many options to configure and to, for it to be practical and like what to use for next or something. So you, it expects you to configure it yourself. You know, make it, it will install the sources to user source Linux version of the number. Go there, make them you config, go through all the options and you know Say that the compiler is not. Doesn't that sound like that? Nope. Well, that's why Gen Gen exists. Gen kernel basically gives you a default configuration for your kernel that has pretty much everything enabled as modules. Um, that you know, modules that will be loaded should be included. Um, and we'll do the compilation step for you. Not the, the actual Install it in your boot folder the partition, and you should be good to go. Now, I believe you were telling me a while back that even Gen Curl was going to be a problem. Oh, uh, no, I didn't try Gen Curl. I tried the manual one. I got to build and got it to reboot, but then it just wasn't responsive. Yeah. 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 But if even Gen Curl is a little intimidating, you can always grab a kernel, a compiled kernel from a binary distro. I have booted the Gen2 system with the Debian kernel. Uh, actually, when I was trying to get the kernel properly configured to boot, having some trouble with that, I just wanted the system to boot, so I copied the, uh, the modules to the firmware over, and just put it up at the Debian kernel. And it worked. It worked great. It's the same kernel, so. Um, of course, you know, Gen2 does actually provide the D package utility and the RPM utility. So you can even just download uh, the dev file from the repositories or onto whatever forward hats or, or uh, whichever kernel you want to use and just install it without having to do any sort of trickery to manually extract it. Um, it doesn't play nice, it doesn't handle dependencies when you do it like that because it's not actually part of the package. But for, you know, for a kernel package, there's not a whole lot of demand dependencies that aren't going to be there anyway. Um, it does leave you with the responsibility to kind of keep tabs on updates and such because it doesn't plug in Debian's actual package management system in the app repositories. So if you're going to go that route, you might want to consider the Ubuntu uh, derivative of Gen2, which has Debian sources available as a package, as well as a uh, Red Hat sources package, or using Red Hat and something. Um, 
with a new spline called the binary that will actually build it on the But it will be in the same configuration as when you just grab the pre built Gambian array and put it in. And we're actually done this, so, so don't, don't hold me that. But uh, save some. So once you've got the kernel builds or installed somehow, there's some file configuration you have to do, your file system, your FS tab, um, you've got a CD ROM drive going out, you've got to put that in there, uh, you've got to put it on a separate partition, you've got to put that in there, your swap space. Uh, you've got to manually configure networking and add it to your boot run level. There's some system tools that you should probably be in, uh, should probably install. A syslog service. Uh, there's a few options that run install by default. A cron service, again, a few options by default. For remote access, SSH is installed by default but not enabled. So I don't want to enable that. Depending on what you're using it for. Um, the utilities for interacting with your file system. If, uh, you're certainly if you're using FireFS and ZFS. You're going to need utilities to manage some volumes and snapshots and also all that other stuff. So install those packages. Uh, you, you just need to run an FSCK on an older file system. You need to install tools for that. Uh, new boot loader. Uh, Grub, Grub2, Milo. Install it and configure it. Uh, configuration is basically more than anywhere else. Some last minute stuff that's largely optional, with um, the exception of that last step. Um, a lot of your users always a good idea, you should probably run this actual boot. So then just thumb out everything. Install anything else you might need, or maybe save that for later. Exit the CH root, unmount everything, reboot, and get into it. So yeah, it's a little more complicated than your average uh, Ubuntu install. Or, uh, it was an adventure doing it. Um, you know, I've, I've tried to switch to Gen 2 a few times in the past, and never just got to that last step. <laughs> It's just another version which downloads the 
the newer time Okay. How many units did you spend? <laughs> Uh, I didn't count. <laughs> um, I'd like to hear some of your wives. Um, uh, oh. Not, not yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because <laughs> 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 wives always. Wait until they fall asleep and then you get all the way along. Yes. <laughs> so when I started it, it took me almost three days to get a desktop. And then it was a pretty desktop. It was a 640 to 480 frame up. The screen was giant and everything was huge. <laughs> Uh, that was the one and only time I ever attempted to build for stage one. Where you actually have to build an LS and all the fans have to use to get past the week. But you stayed three, three days, so I gave you a desktop, and it was a lot of pain. And I spent hours, literally hours. I was even cross compiling. I had a couple of sunboxes. I was using GCC multi compile, so that my little laptop took out to do all the work and compile it over here, compile it over there. Speaking of cross compiling, if you're going to try to do this on a Pi, I did mention install and gentle. I vaguely hinted that install and gentle in mind. Cross compilation is your friend. Yeah. Um, I, I have, um, yeah, my main file server is running a program called distcc, um, which basically farms out the compilation to the more powerful machine. Uh, you, well, you run distcc on both ends, and then your Pi will farm out all the and I can also say, I downloaded the live DVD that work on installing it now as we're having the meeting here. And uh, with the profile select package, it definitely takes a lot of the framework out of what it used to be. Do I need GTK or minus GTK plus GTK? If you want to find the desktop, which is the new KDE, it automatically puts all those things in your use flag so that it says, I don't want to compile GTK, I don't want to compile this, and, and, and it only puts in the stuff you need. And then once you do that and move into stage three to the root environment, you run a, a command that actually updates everything from that stage three firewall, tells it specifically to a file that's not there than you need. It's actually a lot easier than what it was 15 years ago when you tried it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot easier. Yeah, like any more like you want to do a stage one, there's, there's basically a shell script that kicks it off. So it's not even. Yeah, and before you just had to do that image and you were lucky that you could get your network driver to work so you could actually use links, which is a text based web browser, you get your star on and it was bad. And I was like, you got a plasma desktop or a little thing. I was kind of sad to see that it was an install icon, but I guess that was a few times again too. <laughs> but that's the handbook's there for your, just for everyone to pick. So the AMD 64 handbook came up right along with it, so I could basically just go from one side to the other but I had to break. Crap, I can't remember what I had to do next. Like, now you're talking system buying and all those things you before you do You had to do that and other stuff. I didn't know. It's good to have that. Another cool thing about uh, the use flags that you mentioned, and one of the reasons I was looking at the Gen 2 is you can have a use flag for only free software. So, no, no proprietary software. And that way you can't do an emerge and like VLC, and that pulls down like MP3s and all the other uh, proprietary formats. That was one of the reasons I was looking at Gen 2, because I wanted to make it easier to, to move to like a, a totally Libre system. Yeah, and, you're uh, a licensed purist. That, you know. <laughs> so, there's not a lot of other issues that will offer that. Uh, that to say, like, you know, we don't, we don't have any proprietary system or stuff in our, in our repositories. Debbie, to a point, they do couple lines up in and a bunch of similarly, I guess. I don't know about that right now. I'm going to speak on that side, though. It's about the fault of the thing. Don't ever not do that. Always just like, even if you put wine in when you use a game machine, things like that, 90% yes. of the Windows games run 32 bit stuff. What are you going to do? I have to be the player of the office. Don't go to my multi other unless, unless you want a pure 64 bit environment with nothing else. Yeah, like I said, I don't know. If you're, doing like a server, if you're doing something like a server, I can see doing 64 bit because. You're, you're limited to the stuff you're going to run anyway. Yeah, uh, but not, yeah, if you want Steam or games Steam or stuff like that, Steam. yeah, if you want Steam, you have that multi lib. If you want any kind of game, you have multi lib. Like if it's a personal desktop, definitely do the multi lib. Okay. But if it's a, a server or something like really lightweight machine that you just, you know, not going to install a lot of stuff on, or you know, you just want to like be able to SSH somewhere, you know, 64 would be fun. So, so the use case for this. You mentioned no enterprise. I've actually, I know of an enterprise where one of the devs does this. 
and he's hosed himself at least a couple times in the last six months. So he goes to do some update or rebuild and he blows his net by his video drivers out and spending two days fixing it. So Enterprise won't stand for that. Uh, but so this is more of a, a home I, I, I learning experience. Yeah. It sounds like really just to It's certainly a learning experience. It's for uh, developers. That's why I do it. Eric told me, he said, if you want to learn how to use Linux, he said, go Gen 2. And that was 17 years ago. And that's how I learned that that's the only training I have is building Gen 2 and trying to break the building. See, and that's what I do for a living now. I learned how to administer it for an enterprise See, I, I, understand <laughs> what, I understand what you're saying. Like, when I first started messing around with Linux off and on was back in 96. You know, and I kind of went, I think, the other route where I started with simple, you know, automatic installs of, you know, like, say, Mandrake or Red Hat or. You know, and then starting around 2005, you know, it was more like I started playing around more with, like, you know, more, more of the command line where I wasn't using X, you know, in, in some format. I was trying to do it more by hand, and that's where I was starting to play around with Arch and, and whatnot. And so I think I kind of went, in my case, I went from, you know, automated to more, like, probably, I, I would think my next step is probably going to be trying to do with Gen 2, because I think... For me, at least, with how probably I learned, it, it it showed it showed where to avoid errors along the way. That I could that I could see where I went wrong. Yeah. And you learn the command line, and where I worked, there is no X. Yeah. We just say black by default, we turn it off every because it's a known vulnerability. So yeah. We have an internal or we have four thousand images using that spin day that QA sandbox throws on. You will let the command line is definitely a good way to do it. Yeah. Don't necessarily go stage one have to build the command line. Yeah. From stage three, while the commands are there, you just do it. Yeah, and a lot of the advantages of stage one, in theory, can be achieved just by doing the initial, like what I said, rebuild your system. Just do an emerge e system, or emerge e world, and just rebuild everything right at the outset. And from that point, you know, that versus doing a stage by itself, not a whole lot of upside. Thank you. It's a great man to talk about Gen 2. Yeah. <laughs> For people who might not even know what Linux is here. It's a great man. Dive into the piece of things for tech systems for that. This is cheap, and soft, and